Champion number eight, Murray Mixter, joins us. Mix, welcome back. Hello, Martin. How are you? You heard that piece of commentary then. That game yeah. warmed the cockles, did it? Oh, it did for me. I think it's by far the best game of Super Rugby we've had this year. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe the best ever. But Because um, I just thought the first half was absolutely breathtaking. You know, the creativity and the execution, and yet it was only seven seven all at half time. It was attacking and defence, you know, and it just went up and down the field. You know, miles ahead of anything we've seen this year, in my view. Uh, just to just interrupt you, was that in terms of pace of the game as much as quality? Yeah, it, everything. There were, it was full of turnovers. I think the turnovers in that game, were, there were 25 turnovers at the tackle area. Now, that's exceptional. And um, it just, one team attacked and then the other team counter-attacked. It was just attack versus attack. Is that because and, teams are losing the ball mix or is it because of the way that the, those that are going in to retrieve the ball are doing a better job? No, I think it's um, better technique okay. um, when, you're, when you're defending. I think the defensive ability of our super teams at the moment is better than it's been uh, in the past. They've just got technically better. You know, and if you want to, Look at the technical side of yes, please. Things. Um, the most, the clearest example I think is is rugby sevens, which is on at the moment, and it's magnificent. It's in Hong Kong, but you can see at the breakdown um, the actual technique that these players have to use because they can't afford two players to go into one tackle to try and win the ball. One guy's got to get it. You know, if one guy can do it, then you've got an extra man outside. So in sevens, you know, it makes it clear for everyone to see, but in fifteens. There's more traffic and there's more players on the field and it's harder to see the clarity. But to me, better technique, better coaching, um, better attitude towards attack as well as defence. I mean, we just thought that first half was just breathtaking. I was blown away. And then in the second half, it was full of drama. Oh, yeah, the drama <laughs> drama <laughs> everywhere. Well, that's what we want. So we want breathtaking rugby. We want really even competition, and we want a bit of drama. Well, this is what I was going to ask you about, though, because you know, if you're looking at it from a purist point of view, that last five minutes was so full of errors and dumb mistakes and handing possession back. Yes, it's dramatic, but you know, looking at it from a coach's point of view, it was almost a killer for both, wasn't it? Well, no, I actually feel the opposite. It was okay. 15 minutes. You know, like, we just saw some exceptional uh, pressure you know, I mean, I see it differently to what I heard on the uh, heard the commenters commentators. So I thought that first half was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, and then the second because they, they, you know, the, there was a bit of a uh, suggestion at half time that you know the Highlanders were on top, and I disagree with that. Um, I thought that uh, the Hurricanes had the better of the first half, but it was seven each. So let's not uh, pick here. But second half we saw the explosion of one player. Um, Artie Sevier, you know, launch himself into the into the second half and say, listen, I'm I'm your number one seven and I'm your number one eight going into the rugby world. Yeah, Mix, why do you come I mean, this is you always say this that he can play both positions. What is the what is the key difference then between those both and the skills that he has to actually, I suppose, interchange or adjust for the two positions? Yeah, well it, it goes back twenty years where the number eight started attacking breakdown and defensive uh, opposition attack lines, uh, eight and seven together. That started about 20 years, around about my, my time, actually. And uh, all number eights were doing, you know, Zinzan and, um, and, and a lot of other number eights around the world as, as well. And it's just got better and better, whereas the seven and the eight, you know, are really... The, the, you could almost mix the two positions, you know, and we, we do the role of the seven, role of eight, is, is clear. Is clear. There are different attributes required, but they've almost got the same role. One's got a little bit more time to view and make a decision than the other. So you saw Artie Sevier rotating between seven and eight at scrum time. You know, it was it was obvious he was playing both positions. I just think he's on fire at the moment. And you know, um, Kieran Reid's um, short of a gallop, isn't he? You know, because of his injuries and his time off, and and he has to build himself to fire by the time the Rugby World Cup comes. But at, right at the moment, if you're sitting there analysing the seven and the eight, then Artie Sevier's the best at both positions. Murray Mixted is with us, the Orange Insight Mix. The, the thing about Kieran is you always say that that's that line-out option. If, if Artie was to play number eight, you're confident that he can do that as well? Not as well as Kieran. You know, 
I've always said the seven guy that um, you know he's the ultimate number eight at the moment in the world game, um, Kieran Reid. Um, you know, and and there's highs and lows during a season. Well, not highs and lows, but there's 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 definitely times that players peak during a season. At the moment, Kieran's not peaking because he hasn't had enough rugby. But he's got plenty of rugby to go before the the Rugby World Cup. And just on that, Mick, sorry to interrupt you again, mate, but just on that, how long does it take for a player at that age to recover from those injuries and get back to form? Just so that people actually realise, because it's not going to happen in a week, is it? I can't answer that question, uh, but uh, I've got people all around me saying, oh, Artie's a better number eight than Kieran. Well, yeah, at the moment he is, actually. Right. But... Karen Reed has clearly been the world's best number eight for a number of years. And when you've got that class and those attributes, you're going to come back. I mean, you don't get weaker as you get older. You get stronger mentally. So we're talking mentally as well as physical. So it does take time to build that edge so that you fire at the right time. And he will have the best advice anyone's ever had yeah, true. on peaking. So stop worrying about okay. Karen Reed. All right. All right. Look, at the, <laughs> look at the other players that are playing so bloody well. And, you know, it's great. But, but that second half of the Highlanders was just absolutely outstanding. Highlanders and, and uh, Hurricanes, because it was both teams. But what appealed to me so much about this game is 15 minutes to go, the Highlanders took control. And they just camped inside that 15-metre area short of the goal line. They had three different penalties to kick for goal. In fact, yep. I think there were four. Um, and they turned them all down because they were in the meeting. Did you and think that was the right thing to do? I thought in front of that crowd at home, it was probably the right call. Yeah, that's what I think too. But, you know, everyone's got a view on that. If they had been playing away from home, they would have kicked the goal. Yeah, you would have thought, yeah. And yeah. Said, Fair enough. But they didn't. They were true to their players, to their support. Because you'd have to say, um, you know, the Highlanders supporters down there based around a university, you know, are, are more colourful. Than they wanted that. Look, and the other thing is, you imagine if they had scored that try, what it would have done for their season. It would have been three wins, that draw against the Crusaders, three losses, and the momentum created from that. I mean, it's a gamble, wasn't it? It was, and it would have been a great night in Dunedin following it as well. But uh, anyway, listen, Martin, it was just a classic game, and I'm so pleased that I watched every minute of it, and I just loved every moment. And the fact that the Hurricanes showed that resilience, it shows that they are building a team, which brings me to something that I think is really interesting. We are developing the best coaches in the world. Now, anyone listening to this cannot challenge that because you see our coaches all around the world. But we are developing them here in this country and how, how and why, it's exactly the same as players. If you play at a higher level, the higher level you play, the better you become, you know, if you've got that extra level. And there's a lot of guys playing super level that aren't going to be as good at international level that can't go up that next notch, but they're getting better each time they play in a really competitive competition. So it's the same with coaches. So we study in this country, like nobody else in the world, we study the art of coaching. And it is an art. It's not a science. It's an art. You know, there's no one way of coaching. You've, you've got to develop. There's no script. You've got to develop your own, your own template. And that's one thing we do. We debate and discuss how about how, different ways of going about this. And then we have to play in this competition against fantastic coaches. So we've got Aaron Major, who's a relatively young coach, competing against John Plumtree, who's a very experienced coach. And they are really competing. I mean, it was just fantastic watching the the strategy in that game. Right from the start, when Plumtree called six, he picked six forward reserves and two backs, you know, because he need he knew he needed firepower at the end. Aaron Major, when he was interviewed afterwards, he was clearly disappointed. But his mind was so sharp on the strategy of the game. He said, we're trying to do certain things. And... We are beginning to execute those things. Not all of them came off today. And he's probably talking about, in effect, the last 10 minutes where they weren't able to score. And generally speaking, you'd pick them to score. Um, you know, and Ben Smith had a blinder, by the way, we're on that. And, and while, I, while I'm on that again, TJ Perinara, without Aaron Smith on the field, showed that he's probably the number two halfback in the oh, world. Of course, no question. He, I mean, he really stood up. I know everyone makes mistakes, and halfbacks had more 
um, more pressure on them than anybody. Um, he only made a couple of little scrum, scrum moves at the end there, but gee, what a great game. Perinara, what a fantastic scrum half we have going into the two scrum halves we have going into the Rugby World Cup. But Aaron Major is a student of the game. Mark my words. Okay. He is going to get better and better and better. And he will be. He'll be in line for an all-black coaching role at some stage. We will argue Whether about this in the future because I'm not so sure about it, actually. I think he's got he's got weaknesses at the moment, but we're going to have to leave it there because we're running out of time, Mix. The Irons Insight with Murray Mix did the all-black legend happens 